Hey, my name is Derek Murphy, and I'm just so, so glad to be with you this morning. Welcome online as well. And just want to come back, reiterate the fact that in the Word of God, in the book of James, we're reminded that pure religion looks like actually taking care of orphans in their time of need. And so if you want to join into this network and be part of actually serving people who are parenting children who don't have another option to be with their own parents, then uh, you can go out. There's a table uh, in the lobby with a foster love sign at it. And uh, Barb and Rebecca and Amy, they'll all be out there. And you can, you can get to know them. But there's also going to be, from there, a, cl- a little class. It's 30 minutes today. Child care and refreshments are uh, provided, and it's just 30 minutes. So if you want to take 30 minutes of your time to see if it's even a possibility to invest your time in just developing this community and helping people love kiddos in need, that would be great. It, it I think, would be worth uh, the 30 minutes. So today, we're, uh, we're going to be jumping into this next message on Follow Me. But before we do that, I just want to say, man, wasn't our band pretty rocking awesome this morning? Like, get some CCR. I'm- I'm the, I'm the millennial who grew up listening to oldies, so I love some CCR, and uh, I think our, our bands here at K2 could win some awards, but I just wanted to let you know that I have won some music awards myself. Yeah, yeah, I've won some music awards. Uh, when I was in college, I won a karaoke award. <laughs> the song that I won, I'm Too Sexy. So... There you go. Uh, and I've, uh, I've actually won a lip sync battle. Uh, so M&M's Lose Yourself. Okay, so you guys know a little bit more about me. Um, I, you know, the, th- the, thing, the thing about that, that song, though, Eminem, uh, Lose Yourself, if you had one shot or one opportunity, anybody have the next lines? Okay. Uh, you, 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 if you don't know it, you don't know it. But would you capture it or let it slip, right? That's, the, that's how it ends. So uh, this sermon today, I, just, I wanted to highlight that right here. Is we, we all have these potentials within us. I don't know if you've ever felt like you're sitting in this life, you're sitting in this world, and you're going, man, there's this untapped reserve that's somewhere in there, but it's almost impossible to access I don't know if you're out there and you're feeling like that. Like, man, I, there's, a, there's a next gear, but you can't figure out how to fit it in, and sometimes you're like grinding it. But really, today, that's what we're going to be talking about. How do we dive into that next part of our potential? That piece that seems to be untapped, that we're just like, where, how do we get there? There's something that's blocking us in fact, from getting there. And as we look into this sermon, follow me, there's really nothing that's bigger than the call to follow Jesus. When we're talking about a high calling, you know, living up to our full potential is one calling. Following Jesus, that's a whole nother level. So like, how do we get there? I mean, are you guys with me? Like, that's something that I want to know. And, and so today we're actually going to be diving into the life of this guy uh, that's called the father of faith. His name is Abraham, and in the stories that we're going to be looking at, um, it's the early part of his life, and so he actually has a a shorter name at this point of his life. It's called Abram. So we're going to look at how did Abram, in the early parts of his life, tap into these potentials, these these things that some of us just dream about, that we really want to lose ourselves and dive 100% in and see God work. And then to to add into that, one of the reasons we're doing this sermon series is because I think all of us, uh, last week, if you were here, you heard the news that we're not going to be in this facility forever. And there is a time frame to that, right? And and then there's just these fears even about that. Like, we don't have a next location on lock. I mean, we've got great opportunities. But like, what do we do with those, those anxieties that well up in us too? So... I think the story of Abram and what he was really doing when he was trying to walk with God, when God said go, are going to help us take the next step. So you guys ready to jump on into this? Yeah? 
So there's three things, three parts of this tapping into our whole potential that I think are a struggle that we see in this story of Abraham. And I think the struggle is real here. The struggle is real. So the first part of the struggle is that uh, we actually struggle to see. Now, when Abraham was told to go, he was actually wasn't told where. So we'll look into that in just a second. The next part of the struggle is that we all have a struggle to provide. We want to give ourselves and our family, everybody who is under our care security. And what do we do when we can't provide that security? And the third part about this that we're going to look at is the struggle to leave a legacy. These, these things are, I think, part of what actually keep us from living out this untapped potential. We got the struggle and the struggle is real. So the, the first point, the struggle to see, let me just illustrate this. Uh, can everybody who's single in this room go ahead and raise your hand? I promise I won't make fun of you. Okay, I just wanna say, look around, keep your hand up, look around. You're welcome, all okay. right? <laughs> Getting a chance to see. Uh, I, I'm not single, uh, but keep your hand up. I, anybody, who's, uh, anybody who would be willing for me to actually find you a spouse this week, and I'll do other wedding this Saturday, anybody? All right. What? We, oh, we got one. Oh, it's Spencer. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm on it, buddy. Uh, <laughs> right. The, I think this is this is a good good illustration. Uh, besides Spencer, we, we we don't we want to be able to see. Right. When you walk up on the into the altar, right, and you you walk up to your spouse, you don't want it to be the first time, and, and you don't want that veil to be lifted and go, oh, I don't like what I see. <laughs> right? We, we, we want to build that up. We want to be able to see and then decide whether or not we want to take that next step of commitment. And I think that's what we do when we're walking in faith, right? When we're trying to follow Jesus, we really want to see where he's trying to take us. But if we read uh, the story of Abram, here in Genesis 12, 1, it says, the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. The land I will show you. Now, we might think that it's crazy that we're going to be moving into a different facility here at K2 with no idea about where we're going to go. But Abram is being called to leave his tribe to leave his inheritance, to leave everything he knows, his culture, his family. And God says, hey, when you get there, I'll tell you. Like, I'll show it to you. Don't, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll make sure you don't get lost. I, I think, like, compared to our situation, the this, this situation, the story is getting cranked up, right? And, and I've always thought about this story in, in like, comparison to my, and my wife's uh, journey. We went out and lived in East Tennessee, uh, for three years, I went to grad school out there, and we left everything we knew, and we went into a different culture, and it felt really uncomfortable for a little while. But then you think about this, and it's nothing like that at all. Like, it might be close to the same amount of miles. Abram ended up traveling 1,400 miles from his hometown of Ur down into Canaan. Like, that's a long way. But, like, when I was in Tennessee, I had a phone, I could jump on a plane, we ended up moving back. Like, this, this is the thing that he never even got to do. Like, he said goodbye to everything he knew, and that was it. And, and then if you really want to try to dive into the story and understand it at a whole nother level, we see in chapter 14 that Abram's household had, at least a couple chapters later, 318 fighting men that were trained up inside his household, it says. So, he may have picked up a few of these people along the way, maybe in Egypt, uh, but the likelihood is that a lot of these people were part of the house that left. So if you do the math and you look at women and children and older people, this family, this household that leaves and travels 1,400 miles on foot, leaves everything they know, probably has about 1,000 people conservatively who are doing this. I think you can see our story here, right? It's like we have these fears because we've got this big old church and we've got all these people and we need to move. But then you go, wait, 
you guys all have your own houses. I don't need to worry about that. Like, we don't have to worry about anything other than maybe this facility changing and moving a couple miles one way or another in the valley. Like, it's, it's actually not that big of a deal. But still an act of faith, right? But here's the truth, is that God has done bigger things in the past. We know this through the story of Abram. And God will do bigger things in the future. And then, I think, to take it down from just our church down into our own lives, when we're trying to figure out how to tap into our own potential, like there's, there's like struggles, anxieties, there's fears that we actually face that each one of you might be going, like, I, I see what I could be. I see maybe not a full picture, but it's scary to think about taking that step. Who's, who's out there feeling that way? Like, to, to take that job or to uh, leave a job and maybe enroll in college or to uh, maybe foster a child. I'm not sure what the step is that God's been putting on your heart, but the struggle is real. It's a real act of faith. And here's the reason why we actually want uh, to see. The reason we want to see is because we want to see because we want to control. Like if I was Abram, I would want to go do a reconnaissance mission, like take my best guys and go down. Like, hey, we'll be back in like a few months or a year, or however long it takes to do that sort of trip. And we'll go see, like we'll go do some market research. We'll do a risk analysis and we'll just see if, you know, that what we're used to raising as far as crops and herds and all those sorts of things are going to actually work in the other land. Like, can you imagine? Like, and then you get to decide, like, God, show me. I'm going to go look at it, and then I'll decide if I actually want to walk into your story. How many are, would, would like that better? Like, we are all wanting to see, because if we see, we can say yes or no. But you know what we said when we said yes to Jesus? As our Savior, we also said yes to Jesus as our Lord. When he says, follow me, we don't always get the luxury of getting to decide on the front end whether we're going to like what God does on the back end, right? In fact, I think it's oftentimes when we take that first step, it's after the first step that the biggest miracles happen. And it isn't until we actually take that step that we see God work in powerful ways. I mean, not only is this true of the story of Abraham, but we see this with the story of Noah before this. Like, he builds an ark. They can fit two of every animal on the earth before there's ever a single drop of rain on the face of the earth. Like, what in the world? He, like, why would you build this huge mammoth of a, of a, a, a nautical device in the middle of, a, like, a wheat field or wherever he built it, right? Like, that's crazy. Why, you know, when, when Moses leads his people out of the, the promised land, like he has to actually step into the Red Sea before the waters are parted. It's that first step that really <laughs> creates this new opening, this new opportunity for God to work because he knows that he's got a person he can work through when we take that step. <clears throat> now, this is like blind faith, though. And when we talk about blind steps, I think the struggle certainly is real, right? Um, and I just want you to start thinking about, like, where is God actually asking you to take a step? Uh, this, is, this is really, at the end of this message, we're going to take some time in prayer and think about that. But maybe now you already have, like, this inkling. I just want to say, this is something Dave says off often, if you've got this, this kind of burning in your soul right now, like, that's God working, like, and so start to listen. As, as I continue this message, be in tune with what God's trying to speak to you, what he's trying to lead you to, because I know every one of us have a step that we have been maybe dragging our feet on, and he wants us to start taking those steps because he wants to start unleashing his reward in our life. Now, I know the struggle is real, but now we learn not only from Abram's successes, like he actually said yes to go in this insane thing where he takes a thousand people, 1400 miles. But we also learn from Abram's failures, right? And he was like this rock star for the first nine verses. And then his blind faith is tested in the second point today is the struggle to provide. 
We have this struggle to provide. And Genesis 12, uh, 10 through 13 said this, now there was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while, for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. Okay, before we start ragging on Abraham for a second, let's just put ourselves in his situation. Right? Imagine that you just took the step of your life. Think of the thing that you were just even a, maybe having a little bit of anxiety thinking about doing. You take the step, like Abram gets there. God says, this is the land I'm going to give you. And without missing a beat, the next verse, at least in scripture, says there's a famine in the land. Like God says, here's your land. And then, hey, figure out how to feed that thousand people that you came here with. Good luck. Pat you on the back and let you go. Like, this is an insecure place for Abram to be. So Abram decides to make a plan. Because if you read in the scripture here, does God say, Abram, there's no food here. Go to Egypt. Does he? You guys read that. Are you with me? All right. No, he doesn't say that at all, right? He just, who knows? Like, could God have provided for a thousand people in the land that he chose, even in the middle of a famine. Yes. This was Abram's plan, right? And it came out of Abram's fears and insecurities, right? So he had two fears. Primarily, he didn't want his family to die, right? He didn't want them uh, to, to starve to death or to not have uh, water, you know, and so he, he needed to go find a place where there was food. And Egypt always has food because the Nile always floods no matter how bad the drought is. So they're, they know they can go down and get food out of Egypt. And the second fear is that he's afraid that he's going to die, right? And so he, he's, he's afraid he's going to go down and he's got this wife. Um, she's not able to have children, but evidently she's a looker, right? She's beautiful. By the way, she must be like the most beautiful woman in her 60s ever. Like, how many ladies out there in your 60s? Man, you still got it, okay? Just, I just want you to say, don't, don't overlook yourself. Um, Abraham has a plan here. His, his wife he's, is, is a beautiful woman, and he's going to take her down there, and there's going to be some suitors. And in this culture, um, he is the patriarch of his family. And men are going to come. And when they come to potentially court his wife, sister, whoever this person is, um, they're going to bring gifts. And then other men, hopefully the, the plan would be that a lot of men will be bringing gifts and they're in the position where they have nothing because there's a famine. So hopefully a lot of people come courting. It says in this scripture, say you're my sister so they will treat me well for your sake, right? This is what's happening. They're going to all bring gifts. Now, here's what happens. Abram's plan actually backfires because it's too good. There's one guy later in the story who doesn't need to come courting because he's the most powerful man in the land. This guy is named Pharaoh, and he's the king, right? So Pharaoh comes and he says, you know what? Your wife is beautiful, and I'm just going to go ahead and take her. So Pharaoh takes her into his household, and we see that God ultimately has to bail him out of this situation. And so this plan that Abram comes up with leads to a lot of issues, a lot of problems, and it comes out of his insecurity. And I just want to make a quick note that when we make plans out of our insecurity, they rarely match up with the plans that God has in your life. When God calls Abram, he says, I'm going to make a great nation of you. How do you make a great nation out of a man who has no children, and now he has no wife so that he can have no children? This 
is where his plans take him. <clears throat> now, it makes sense when we're in the midst of insecurity, like what basis do we have to trust God, especially when we take that step of faith and then he doesn't show up? Well, we have a hard time trusting God for security, probably because God doesn't ever promise us security. Did you catch that? We have a hard time trusting God for security because he doesn't ever promise us security. But what he does promise us is freedom. What he does promise us is purpose, and he promises us peace, right? If you go and you look at the teachings of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, he says, hey, don't worry about what you're going to eat, drink, and what you're going to wear. Basically, don't worry about the, the, the things in life like food and clothes and shelter. Don't worry about any of those things. Like, God knows you need them, but he doesn't then say, and he will give them to you. He just says, God knows you need them, right? God knows you need them, but then he goes on to say, instead, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom. So if you put God's priorities first in your life, that, that stuff will all work out. Like, 99% of the time, you just won't even have to worry about it. The, the problem is that when we seek after the things that we know we need, and God knows we need, we actually lose out on the reward that God wants to give us because we're focusing on the wrong things and we've got the wrong perception. It's, it's kind of like this. How many of you like to cook? All right. I, I like to cook. I'm not, I don't know if I'm a great cook or not. Um, you know, I'm better at karaoke, I guess, but, um, but I like, I mean, salt and pepper, they're, they're the go-tos, right, for, for seasoning any dish. And so just imagine my, my, my uh, uh, cabinet, what do you, spice cabinet, right? My spice cabinet is pretty narrow, so you can only have like a couple, a few spices right in the front. I don't know how yours is, but the, the salt and the pepper are always in the front of the spice cabinet because I use them every single day, right? And it, how many of you have to pay like your mortgage every month? What about your cell phone bills? How many of you, you know, need, need to just like have, you have some debt and you need to pay that all the time too. They're like always wanting you to pay on your credit cards. Like, yes, that is something that we all have to deal with, but it's, we see it and it's like in the front of our cabinet, in the spice cabinet, right? It's, it's often in front of our faces because we have to deal with it all the time. And they don't all come like the same day of the same month, right? It's like they're spread out throughout the month and you have to pay bills. And so money and finances and bills and all these things are always in our face. It's kind of like the salt and the pepper, right? But when you go, it's like Christmas time or, or Thanksgiving, do you only use salt and pepper, like, I don't, I mean, hopefully you don't just use salt and pepper all the time, but you, there's like some special seasonings for grandma's recipe, right? And you kind of got to reach back into the back of the cupboard and pull those things out for those special occasions. And it, it's, it's like God actually has those special seasonings back there. He's, he's like, he wants to do something, some sort of special recipe with your life. He doesn't want to just make the mundane salt and pepper every time. Like, God's got a special recipe. And guess what? KFC's special recipe has 11 herbs and spices, okay? You guys know that. I mean, can you imagine how many, if the colonel has 11 herbs and spices, how many is God going to use, right? He's, he's reaching all throughout the cupboard, and he doesn't want us just to get, like, blinded by what's in front of us. Like, God will provide and he does want to make us into something great. Like, that's the reward that God has for us. In Genesis, uh, let's see, like, let me check out my notes here. Oh, let, let's, let's head on to the next point, the struggle to leave a legacy. This, this ties in with this idea of, like, God wants to do something great in his life. And if we're just looking at the things that keep that, that thing, like what we have, secure. If we're just, you know, trying to maintain what we have, it's always going to be taken away from us. And that also has to do with this legacy we want to live. Like, we all want to leave a name, like leave a lasting legacy. We want to make a name for ourselves, right? Like, 
We want to prove ourselves. I don't know how many of you, like when you got out of college or you got out of high school and you had your first career, like you worked more hours than you ever have in your whole life because you wanted to prove that you could do it. Make your mark, make a name for yourself. Well, Abram, uh, we actually see in his story, uh, in chapter 12, at the beginning of his story, uh, he, he's set apart from the people that come right before him. Chapter 11, there's this story called the Tower of Babel. And in the Tower of Babel, there's these people who build this tower because they want to make a name for themselves. But then you have this person of Abram in, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. And it says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Aon in the east, there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So in comparison to the people that came before Abram that wanted to just make a name for themselves, that's what they're trying to do. So they built a tower to themselves. We have this guy who goes and leaves everything behind. He's married to a woman who literally can't extend his legacy. And when he shows up to this land that God gives him, instead of building a house, like I imagine all of us would, right? He instead builds an altar. And so with this person of Abram, we have a man who's willing to put God's name ahead of his own name. But in this story, that again, is tested, right? Are we willing to consistently put God's plan and God's name ahead of our own plan and our own name? Well, Abram had a plan for that as well because God told him, hey, go to this land that I will tell you and I will make you into a great nation. Well, his wife couldn't have children and so he brings his nephew. Now, this is in Abram's mind, like the only way that God's going to make a great nation through his family line is I can't have kids, so I'm going to just like invest in and mentor and spend time with this nephew of mine. And eventually he will come up and he'll be raised up and he'll be like me enough that he will be the one who extends my family line. And we see in chapters 13 and 14 that, that Abram is tested in this. Like specifically Lot, because Abram and Lot's herds and herdsmen are quarreling, like Abram lets Lot go and live in the city of Sodom. And then that city gets ca- taken captive and carted off and Abram takes those 318 fighting men we were talking about and he goes and he captures them and he brings them back. And this king of Sodom, he says, hey, I don't care if you keep everything, but what I want are my people. And guess where Lot's been living? Lot's been living in Sodom, right? And so Abram says, not only will I give you the people, but I'm not going to keep a strap of a sandal. I'm not going to keep a penny. Just take everything. And he lives with this sort of open-handed trust that God's going to do something. But it doesn't test him, right? It does not test him because in Genesis chapter 15, uh, in the very beginning of that that. Uh, after, verse 15, after verse 1, he's actually upset because he's freed his nephew Lot and he sent him back to Sodom, but he says, now my servant Eleazar is going to be the one who inherits my whole household. Like, what am I supposed to do, God? And God shows up into the middle of that and says, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and your very great reward. I just want to say the struggle is real, right? The struggle is real for all these things. Like when we're trying to live out the life that we think we have in front of us, all these things try to vie for our attention. But when we actually let God take it, we release it and we trust the story he's trying to tell with our lives, The reward is also very real. Right here it says, hey, Abram, I know right now you're you're struggling to like trust that I'm going to do something with your family, but your reward 
isn't your family. Your reward isn't your legacy. Your reward is me. Now, some of you might be wondering, like, how good is that? <laughs> it's like, I, I want to extend my family line. Why? Well, I don't know if you've experienced the presence of God, but if you never have, the presence of God is the only thing that can give us peace. It's the only thing that can help us feel actually that fullness. You know that feeling that we was talking about where it feels like something is missing, where we're not actually living out our potential? I just want to tell you today that it's when we're living in the center of God's presence that that feeling goes away. Because we start to know that God is with us no matter where we go. And the problems that Abraham, uh, Abram had was when he was afraid. And when we have God's presence with us, we're no longer afraid. When we have God's presence with us, we don't ever have to make our own plans anymore. God is walking with us. So the only way we're gonna get protection and certainty is if we're with him. He says, I am your shield. I'm, gonna, I'm your reward. So today I'm, I'm sitting here in front of you and I, I just say we gotta choose our struggle. Like we either get to choose to struggle on this path to walk with God, which by the way, Jesus says, if you follow me, it's called a narrow road, but it leads to life. It's a struggle. It's like going uphill on a hike but it actually takes us somewhere. Or we can struggle with our own plans that might feel good for a little while, they might take us somewhere, but like Abram, they end up getting frustrated. Like they don't ultimately work. So are we gonna experience the struggle on the front side or are we gonna experience the struggle on the back side? <clears throat> now, God wants to do something great with each and every one of us. Genesis 12, I've been referencing this, verses two and three said, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all the people on earth will be blessed through you. Now, what does this verse say? Who will make you into something great? I will make you. God is going to be the one who does it. And how is he going to make you into something great? It says he's going to make you into something great by becoming a blessing. Today, God is looking for kingdom partners. But they've got to be kingdom partners who are willing to lay down their fears and lay down their plans and actually step confidently into the presence of God. I don't know what you're afraid of today, it might be that what we've talked about, like your legacy, your security, you can't really see far enough into the future. Well, I'm not sure. It might be something else. It might be something from your past, like a hurt, a pain you've experienced, and you're worried about that happening to you again. Well, the only way that you can actually rise up into the full potential of what God has for you is to actually give those over to him and to take that first step. I just want to lead you through a quick time of prayer. And, and I want you to think about two things. What is the fear that you have that's actually holding you back from taking that step? And then if that fear was gone, what would be that step that you would take? Let's pray. God, I, I pray right now for your people here that are sitting here and, and listening to your word and what you did with your person, Abraham, your man, that was willing to build your kingdom instead of his own, that was willing to lay down his legacy, who was willing to give up his nephew. Lord, we know he's going to struggle again moving forward. We, we've, written, we've read the story. But Lord, in this moment, he actually had victory and he was willing to give up the fear. And so, Lord, I pray right now you would speak into the hearts of your people. Lord, where, where is it? Will you reveal to them where they have fear that's blocking them from becoming the person that you made them to be? Lord, 
show them the fear that's keeping them from living out the identity that you called them to. And Lord, right now, I just pray too that you would come alongside them. And if that was gone, if you didn't have anything to fear anymore, let's just pretend that didn't exist. What would you do with your life? What has God been speaking and trying to whisper into your soul for so long? I don't know if it's a career path or if it's some sort of way to serve in the body or maybe it's like me and it's God's been calling you to actually go over to your neighbor's house and to start talking to them about the relationship with Jesus. If that fear was gone, what would you do? What's that step? Lord, I, I pray that you would just come alongside your people, Lord. And as they think about that step, I just pray you'd give them vision around it. Lord, what would it look like if they did it? Lord, they may not know the whole story, but maybe give them enough to be excited about taking that step that has a lot of fear with it. Lord, thank you for taking it away. Lord, thank you for showing us how to struggle, but then on the backside of the struggle, receive your reward. God, we thank you for everything you've blessed us with, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Real quick, I want to challenge you. If there was something, a first step, that God put on your heart and on your mind, I challenge you to tell somebody today before you leave. It's always good to have a family around us who's willing to spur us on toward love and good deeds, right, is what we're asked and, and commanded to do for one another. So talk to each other, like ask each other even, what is God trying to do in your life? What is the step that he wants to do? But go ahead and let's continue worshiping our God this morning.